The next, the next thing we're going to review is the basics of the uh, reading of the Toli, right? And I think it's going to be very important for you guys, uh, right? Especially when you're going to be uh, doing skills, but also when you're going to be on the street. So this is the anatomy of the Lord. Uh, for the purposes of this class, you only really need to know the three main coronary arteries. Well, it's essentially two coronary arteries. It's the right coronary artery and the left coronary artery, which then, right, extends, it becomes the left anterior descending and the circumflex. Now, what, what's very important is what they feed, right? So when we look at the EKG, we have to determine which coronary artery is involved and what they feed. So if you look closer, right, the right coronary artery, right, it comes off the aorta, right? And it feeds the right atrium, right? It feeds the right ventricle, and then it goes back to the posterior wall. So it feeds the posterior wall. And very important, it also feeds the SA node and the AV node, right? So this coronary artery feeds SA node and AV node. Now imagine if I take this coronary artery out, I have a thrombus right here. Do you think it would be a good supply to the SA node? Yeah, so SA node, will it be affected? A little bit. Will the SA node will be affected? A little bit. Yeah, so what type of rhythms do you expect? Slow or fast? Uh, Slow rhythms, right? Maybe maybe SA node is not working, but the AV kicks in, right? So you'll see brain dysrhythmias and heart blocks. That's how you gotta look, right? So when you see when you see it, right, the right side of the heart involved, right? Now, the left side of the heart feeds the anterior wall, right? So the left atria, the left ventricle, and we have the circumflex that goes around the heart and feeds the lateral wall of the left ventricle. Now, you guys ever heard of this thing called the widow maker? Yeah. 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 It's like when the, hus the husband dies, right? So what, what was the widow maker? The widow maker was high proximal left occlusion. So if you have occlusion here, it's going to take out the entire ventricle. You're going to be in massive cardiogenic shock, right? You won't be able to pump blood, right? On some patients, what you want to remember, some patients, the posterior ventricle is fed either by the RCA, and some patients, it could be the circumflex. You see how these vessels run to the back? So for the some patients, the left ventricle, posterior wall, is either fed by the RCA or the circumflex. You wouldn't know until you actually take them to the cath lab and you see, right? Uh, but that's what usually happens. Now, the other important question is the blood that's actually in your heart, in your in your chambers, like <coughs> the ventricles, the atria, is that this is that blood perfusing the heart in, in those areas? No. 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 What perfusing what's perfusing the heart is these coronary arteries. And what do they get fed? During systole or diastole? Diastole? No. Systole. 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 Who says who says the coronary arteries feed the heart during contraction, during systole? Raise your hands. Uh, let's break it down. Like. <laughs> or raise your hands if you think the heart is being fed by these coronary arteries during diastole. All right. So the, those does people... Does it matter? It does matter. It does matter. Like, shouldn't it be getting fed... No, it, it, it matters because it's follows, right? So I'll show you. So, so look, the way the way your heart looks, right? If, if you look at the the muscle, right? If I unravel all the all the layers, right? Your heart is like this. So when it contracts, like if you wring out your clothes after doing laundry manually, right? You're doing like this. That's how your ventricles contract. And now the vessels that are running on the the coronaries, if the heart contracts like this and it squeezes. Do you think there's, yeah, do you think there's good flow through them? No. No. The other important thing, the other important thing to know, right, that not only when it contracts, there's something else called the aortic valve, right? What is the purpose of the aortic valve? It's so the, the, the purpose of the aortic valve, right, is to move, is to open and then push the blood to the all, the, all your body, right? So this is the aortic valve. And here you have the right coronary artery and you have the left coronary artery. So when your heart contracts and it does this, right. right, the aortic valve opens and it blocks the passages to both the right coronary and the left coronary. So your right and left coronary arteries, they come from the aortic ostium. And this valve blocks the flow of blood. So when do the, the heart gets fat is during diastole, when the aortic valve shuts, it's no longer squeezed like this, the heart relaxes. And then the, the backflow of the blood is able to fill, to fill the coronaries. So when is the heart uh, filled with blood? During diastole. When it's not being filled is usually during systole, right? Usually. So 
So then we have to take something into account, right? Uh, what is longer, systole or diastole? What's, what's longer in time, I should say? Systole or diastole? Diastole is longer, because the heart has to fill, right? Not only the heart has to fill, the coronary arteries have to be fat. Now imagine I take your heart rate, right? Your heart rate was 60 beats per minute. This was your diastolic phase. And now your heart rate is now 130 beats per minute. This is your diastolic phase. Is it shrinking? Yeah. yeah. So now let's make it 180, 200. Diastolic phase shrinking? The heart is not going to get blood. The heart is not going to but not only, But not only the heart is not going to get blood. What do you think happens to your coronaries? They collapse. They're not going to get blood either. So if this... Pro, if this if this tachycardia pro prolongs for a long time, you're going to get what type of MI? Uh, two. Type 2. Type 2. Why do you get type 2? Because severe bradyotachyarrhythmias are going to cause that, right? So this is the reason why. So that's why you want to be... Why do we... Like, uh, uh, some of you will say the following, and I want to make sure you guys understand this. You'll say, okay, I got this guy. He's having, you know, severe heart rate, but he's stable. I'm just going to take him to the hospital. We're three minutes away. We shouldn't do anything. We're going to take him to the hospital. What do you think happens when you bring him to the hospital? He dies. He doesn't. First, you got to get no, triaged. He has sat there for hours. Yeah. You got to, first, you got to get triaged. But until your name is in the computer, nobody, no doctor can put an order. And no nurse will take the order. So until you come in, get him registered, get him triaged, then the name pump pops up, then the doctor has to evaluate, put the orders, then the nurses will give the medications. You essentially... In your mind, he's three minutes away, but you, you can't be looking how far away from the hospital. You got to look from the moment you bring him to the hospital. How long does it take him to give him the care? So don't just, yeah, don't do not. What I'm saying is, do not initiate ALS because thinking I'm all oh, three minutes away. Definitely initiate ALS and then take him to the facility because it might take him hours until he gets the care. So you definitely want to address if he has SVT, right, or take a dysrhythmia. Because if it stays like this, right, the heart, the diastolic phase is short, right? So that's very important. So, and the way the coronary arteries run into the heart, they start on the periphery, right? And they, and they traverse their way in. So this is this portion we call the endocardium, right? This is the myocardium, the thick portion. This is the epicardium. So all MIs, when you have a thrombosis, or say thrombosis here, right? The MI actually starts here. We say it's subendocardium. And then as the time goes by, more of the myocardium will be involved. As it uh, traverses through the walls, we call it transmural. Why we call it transmural? Several layers, right? So first, it's blockage is here. This is not being fed, and it progresses out, right? So if I look, if I look, right, this is what, what we worried about is this portion here, right, the big myocardium. <laughs> if I take this out, it can't really contract. And then when we look at the EKGs, right, initially, right, what do we what do we see? So initially we see the zone of ischemia, right? Subendocardial. You probably see T wave inversions, right? Then you have zone of injury. This you got steady. So if you take them to the cath lab in due time, right? And you open this coronary artery, right? You will salvage this. As time goes by, he goes to injury, zone of injury, right? You have Q wave development, and this tissue cannot be salvaged, right? Uh, do you think it conducts well? you think it can propagate signals well? No. no, it cannot. That's why you'll have the Q waves there. Do you think it will contract well? No. no. So that the patient may have, may be suffering congestive heart failure later on, right? So as time goes by, they say time is muscle, right? And so a lot of this is on you to determine if they have a STEMI and then, right, uh, transfer them to the proper facility. So what ST segment elevation is, is elevation of your ST segment. Right, you see this ST segment is isoelectric, but here's elevated. So now we gotta look at the right this pattern here, right? So how do how do I determine this? First I always find not the ST segment, I always find the P to T segment. So this is my P wave, right? This is my Q R S, this is my T. So let's pretend this goes all the way here. So this is my T wave, right? So I always find my T to P segment, which would be here. And this makes up my baseline. This is my isoelectric baseline. From here, if I have a paper or like a little strip of EKG, I'll then move it to the next portion, which is my ST segment, and I put it here. And then I count up how many boxes I got. I got one, two, I'll say three boxes, right? When you're going up in height, every box is how much? 
one millimeter. If you go in length, how much is each box? 0 0.04 seconds. So here, if I had three boxes on elevation, I'll say I have ST segment elevation three millimeters. Everybody follow? If I, if I don't have elevations, right, there's no elevations. So how, how do I determine ST segment elevation? I first find the T to P segment. This is my baseline. From here, I then move it to the ST segment, and I count one, two, three, right? Three millimeters elevations, right? So now that you understand what ST segment elevation is, right? Just just so we are clear, let me show you on this guy. It does, it does. So, so you, the higher up it is, right? The more injury. And before in New York City, Remac, we used to have this protocol where if they have more than two millimeters, it will be direct admit to the cath lab. Basically, you bypass the e so ER. ER. No, you still transmit, but now the, 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 the telemetry will call and they will notify them, right? So, so what, what I was saying, right? You guys see this, is, this would be the T wave, this would be the P wave, right? So I find my T to P segment, right? You see T to P segment baseline. I always do this first. And then I move this paper over to my ST segment. And from here, I start to count, right? So I say, okay, so let's say this is half a box, one, two, three, four, four and a half boxes of ST segment elevation. Or here they said five millimeters, right? Let's say five boxes, right? Five boxes of ST segment elevation. This is how you're gonna determine, right? So don't, don't start on the ST segment. First find the T to P segment, and from here move over. So this way you will never have a problem. Uh, finding right your your segments. So we now we know how to look for the STEMI. What the 12 EDKG does is basically looks at all the views of the heart and makes a picture. 12 EDKG is uh, what what you're going to use it and what I want to explain. 90% of the time you want to find STEMI, right? Uh, there's other things, but this is what we look at all the angles, right? This is the chest leads. It's looking at the anterior septal and lateral walls of the heart, so it makes a curvature around the heart. Right? And we are going to correlate the findings on the EKG to the coronaries. The ones that you have to remember, the right coronary, the left coronary artery, right, which subdivides into circumflex and the anterior descending, the LAD, left anterior descending. Right? So now I'm going to kind of skip forward to show you the whole thing, and then we'll go back. Right? So here. Right? So this is, imagine this 12 lead, I just put like color-coded boxes on it to show you the walls of the heart that it represents. Right, and what it, what these boxes represent? They represent the anatomical contiguous parts. What contiguous means is this: my my hand is contiguous to my forearm. My hand is not contiguous to my elbow because this the whole el the whole forearm is missing. So contiguous le leads looking at the same portion of the heart. So the two three ADF is looking at the inferior wall, and the inferior wall of the heart is fed by the right coronary artery. So this three is by right coronary. Then V1, V2 is the septal wall, right? And this is fed by the LAD, left anterior descending. V3, V4 is anterior wall, fed by left anterior descending. V5, V6, one and AVL is by the circumflex artery, right? This, the left circumflex. And sometimes they will say, this is the low lateral and this is the high lateral, right? The high lateral wall, this is the low lateral wall. And at times, you may have a combination of the two. So, for example, let's say we're talking about a guy who has in, having the Widowmaker high up. The left main is blocked. So, I expect the LAD is blocked. I expect the circumflex is blocked. Oh, so, the so, I'll expect all of this, right, will be affected, right? So, if let's say only if this is affected, I know it's, it's the, the lesion is distal. It's on the circumflex. If somewhere is here, I know it's the RCA, right? But... What you gotta keep in mind, the 12 DKG does not look at where, at the posterior wall of the heart. You cannot see the back. How would you know what's back doing? Uh, 15, 15, 15 EDKG. I'll show you, I did a, I did one uh, EKG actually. You guys, uh, there's an instructor here, uh, Joey. Anybody know Joey? Yeah, so he was my EMT partner on the, on the call. I'll show you the 15 EDKG. I run the EKG and I see no elevations, but something I'll show you tells me this possibility of posterior MI. And then I took the leads off the front and I put them in the back. I did it relatively quickly. And he looked at me like, uh, he's like, you do know those things go in the front, right? Like he was, <laughs> he was, he was telling me, I'm like, like, just give me a second. You'll see what happens. And I'll show you the EKG, right? But uh, so far, is this clear? Wait, right? could you repeat 
Wait, which one is from circumflex? Circumflex is V five, V six, one and AVL. V five and V six is the low lateral, and this is the high lateral. And then right was anterior. The the right corner area was the two, three, and AVF. Right, that's where we see elevations. And then the, the this is the LAD one, two, three, and four is fed by left anterior descending. So if I go back to the this diagram, right, first we, this is the coronary arteries, and this one is showing you, right? So let's say if I had the anterior infarction, right, uh, ideally, right, the anterior infarction is usually, truly speaking, it'll be V3, V4. Here they show you V2, V3, V4. Why? Because it's fed by the LAD, right, the LAD. LAD feeds V1, V2, V3, V4. Here they show you the lateral infarction, so you'll see high lateral, right? High lateral infarction will be one and AVL, right? One and AVL. Uh, here, uh, this is posterior infarction, right? Uh, one of the things on the EKG that may tell you there's possibility of posterior infarction, you may have depressions in V1, V2, V3. See how it's depressed, right? But there's no elevation, so you don't know until you do the posterior leads for them. Uh, here's the inferior one, the, the one we've got uh, common we've seen, right? Two, three ABF elevations, right? This is a chart basically shows you everything that I just explained to you, right? The, all the areas uh, of the heart that are infarcted and where to look, so kind of go forward, right? Uh, and uh, I'll put this chart up, but uh, this is basically tells you which uh, walls of the heart are affected and which leads they correspond to. The ones you really need to know is, is the first one, right? Is anterior wall. And here they say it's the segment elevations, V1, V2, V3, V4, because it's fed by the LAD, right? Then you have the lateral wall, right? Which is the high lateral would be one and AVL. Then you have the inferior wall, which is two, three AVL, right? And then you may have a combinations, right? Where you have the anterior septal, anterior lateral, inferior lateral, right, posterior wall of my, right, posterior wall of my, and then you have right ventricular involvement. So for the basic stuff that you need to know, you need to know the basics, anterior, lateral, inferior, and then as the course progresses when we do cases with you, know that there may be combinations of the leads and there are more than one vessel that may be involved, right? Uh, right, so uh, this, is, this is your standard normal EKG, there's no elevations, right, and here, Right. Remember, I was telling you what to do, right? I find my T2P segment, right? So this is my T2P. So this is my my segment. I move over it to the ST and I see elevations, right? Let's say one, two, three, four, four boxes. Then I do the same thing here, do the same thing here, right? And so if I were to describe the CKG, right, where do we see elevations? Inferior. We see elevations two, three AVM, which is corresponding to which coronary artery? Inferior. Inferior, right? Uh, not inferior coronary, right coronary. Right coronary. Right coronary. Right coronary artery. It's an inferior, inferior wall, but right coronary artery. Do I expect these guys to have fast heart rates or slow heart rates? Slow, slow because SA node may be affected. Uh, RCA feeds the SA node. And then the next thing I look for is reciprocal changes. So on the lateral lead, you see how it's depressed right here? Why it's depressed is because the lateral wall will be the, the lateral wall, if, if I have an inferior, so let's say if this is my heart, and I'm having the, the lower wall in parking, right? The lateral wall would be the reciprocal changes, the mirror image. And that's why we see the right depressions. So always, if, if you have depressions that basically cements your diagnosis, means they're probably having NMI until proved otherwise, right? So we call this a STEMI, you're definitely gonna transmit this in your city re region, right? Do not transport them, even if you know the cath lab is nearby. Why do you, why would you, do you know why you'll be restricted if you just, let's say you're in, in a guy's home, across the street is, let's say, X hospital with cath lab. The, the machine could be down, there could be a patient in it. Perfect. It's you got it. So the reason why you got to call the doctor is because they're going to call that cath lab and say, hey, is this doctor so-and-so available for the procedure? Or he may not be. Maybe he's he left or he's taking care of another patient at the moment. The wait time could be the difference to transport to the go. hospital. They, it might be hours. So that's why don't do not take them do not take them to the closest always call and transmit right so that's that's very important right that you do that this this is what I was uh, telling you about right so so you want this is what from your protocols right 
so if you have at least one millimeter elevations, we're going to transmit and we're going to uh, write, we want to take them to the cath lab, but first we've got to take them to the online medical control uh, so they can take a look. Uh, and this is what we're looking for, right? So here they say history of the physical exam shows MI, so they have a chest pain, at least one millimeter elevations, right? And, uh, and what a contiguous leads, I just told you, they look at the same uh, aspect of the heart, same place of the heart. Right, so this is what we look for. Now, this was your standard MI, right, where you have pl plaque buildup and rupture. Usually, usually this happens not on those stable plaques, but those uh, unstable plaques, right? They are, they are labile, they have a lot, large lipid pool, and they have vulnerable plaques, that's what we call it. And when they rupture, right, a thrombus comes in to plug up the hole. So here we see the thrombus occluding the coronary artery. This actually, this is your type one MI, right? This is where you take them to the cath lab, then they put a stent, right? So this guy was having chest pain, right? Why he's having chest pain? Mm. The lumen is narrow, and all the platelets, right? The fibrinogen is is basically the clotting cascade, prothrombin into thrombin and fibrinogen into fibrin, right? And then you guys ever heard of this drug, uh, TPA? What, does, yeah. what do you think TPA does? Uh, Thrombolytic. TPA, TPA break, break, breaks this guy up. Mm -hmm. It will lyse fibrin. But TPA, do you think it only works in the heart? No. no. It works everywhere. That's why it's very dangerous if you give it and you don't go through all the contraindications. Yeah. Uh, do you know where they use thrombolytics? When, where they use thr thrombolytics? Yeah. So, I know not in New York, but you know where Yeah, so if you're very rural, like you're transferred to the mm -hmm. hospital, Stroke. yeah, will be very far, they will use it, right? In New York City, I know there is a uh, stroke ambulance, they use it. Yeah. Uh, the other thing, this, this, this is also something very important for you to know, and that all of you sitting here, listen very carefully because it's going to happen to you. In New York City, there's not one receiving hospitals that are not cath lab capable, yeah. right? Now, you take this guy who's maybe having a STEMI, you never did it totally. You take him to that place. What do you think happens? <laughs> he dies because he sits in the waiting room. So what do you think happens? So let's take, let's take, I'll pinch your situation. You're working, you're working in the city, right? You got, you got, you get called for a typical call. I had this a lot of times. You get called to city MD, right? Or fast, fast urgent care. The guy, they say, oh, it's a lady. She's having indigestion. We give her some pepto -bismol. You're like, oh, GI pain, no problem. No toilet, nothing. You roll in through this 91 receiving. They have no cat lab. The ED runs the toilet, STEMI. They gotta transport them out. Yeah. So, but but this is what you don't understand is that the hospital now has the doctor has to look at this thing. They also have protocols just like you do, and the protocol for the AHA says the following: they have 90 minutes door to balloon time to the PCI, and they have 30 minutes to thrombolytics. Let's say they cannot arrange fast enough for the transport unit to come and take them to the cath lab in 90 minutes. What do they have to do? Try and get the drug to them. They, they, have, to, they have to give thrombolytics. They have no choice. How if he has another pot? Uh, no, because look, if the doctor doesn't give him thrombolytics and he accepts the transfer, which is like uh, like greater than 90 minutes or a known ETA, right? You, you now have time as muscle. You're not providing pr uh, appropriate care for the patient. So if you guys take the patient to a non cath lab capable facility not doing it wholly, that person is going to get most likely TPA infused because they cannot transfer them in time. And the, the way the doctors and PAs rationalize this is this. Do I want to get sued mm -hmm. if I don't get them to the cath lab? And if I call a private agency, I don't know how long the ETA is. They tell me 20 minutes, but really, I don't know. I don't know, right? So it depends, right? So my advice to you, right? If you're not sure, just run the tolly, right? So if, if, if you do take them to a cath lab capable facility, how, what do they do? So they run the catheter either through the groin or through the brachial artery, and they're going to move it through the aorta, right? And we know both the right, the right and left coronary arteries, they come from the aortic ostia, and then they're going to push die. They're going to put them on the, on the screen. It's called fluor fluoroscopy. And I'm going to push die, right? And I want to see, right? So you know what this is? Not the map of the artery. What do you think this is? Coronary arteries along the side. Yeah. So this is this is this is this is what I watch. So so you guys you guys only need to know three coronary arteries, right? Just three. Just three. Which this is which three? The right coronary, and essentially the second one is the left main, which subdivides into LAD and the circ, right? But when I get a report when from the cath lab, oh, we bring you somebody to the CCU, and we put a stent 
in the distal RCA, or we put a stent, right, in second diagonal or mid circumflex or whatever, right? Yeah. Do you think I remember all this? I don't know. You might. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I don't. You right. So, the with all the so, so basically, I, I look up at the chart, so I see where they place the stent. So when they give the report, they say how, which vessel they deployed. But the, the cardiologist, the interventional cardiologist, they have to know all of these because they know where to deploy the stent. How do they know where to go based on the EKG? Based on the EKG, right? So they look at the coronary and then they place a stent. So this is what where the stents get deployed, right? And this is the basically the vasculature of the heart, right? Uh, here you see, right? So this is the right coronary artery, right? This is the, the circumflex, the LED. So when they push the dye, do you see how this is blocked? So this is the RCA. So that, so when the doctor is there, they know, right? Right? There is blockage there, or maybe there is platelets, or there is, right, atherosclerotic <laughs> plaque. So when they go with the stent, they know exactly where to put it, right? So here is the doctor. Right. Uh, the, by the way, they call interventional cardiologists. Anybody know why? Because there are cardiologists that are intervening. No. <laughs> <laughs> do, do you know where this procedure first originated from? No. Radiology. I'll show you. I'll show you in a bit. But basically, when you bring the guy in, they'll put him on the cath lab, right? And he's going to go through the groin or through the arm, and then they're going to put this uh, coated stent, that's usually coated with certain medication, so that there's no platelets forming on it. Uh, this is called this is called angioplasty when they put the balloon, right? They open up the vessel with the balloon and then they put a stent over that balloon to reperfuse the vessel and then they'll tell you right where it is employed. So if you do this in time you could actually salvage a lot of the heart, right? Uh, so this is the, the stent, how it looks, right? Uh, now uh, this shows you the plaque and vessel wall, right, and what happens now. Uh, so, this guy, right, the Ronald Ronsek. So, the, you know what's 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 kind of sad at the same time and funny. So he presents this at the AHA, right, in 1976. He said, "Listen, we could, we could do this procedure." He showed that I think he used dogs. He said we could run, we could use the catheter to open the coronary arteries, right? Would he? And he, he said we could put stents and we could save the heart. You know what they you know what they said at, at this conference to him? What do you think they told him? But he presented this. We're taking oh, your life crazy. Crazy. Sit down and they, shut up. They, exactly. They say this guy's crazy. He's nuts. He said, Who's gonna do this? Nobody's gonna do this. You're insane, right? But but right? They they thought he was crazy. That's what they said. They rejected him. He said this is nonsense, nobody's gonna do it, right? But radiologists, the guys who do the, the procedures for the veins and arteries, right? You know, if you have like varicose veins, right? They, they said, you know what, this is actually very smart, and they adopted it, right? And so look, from 1976, that's his Tinder in 1977, right, the guy became super famous, and this procedure was adopted, and they started performing the health. That's game face. Right, so, and the reason why... It's the, bad, too, that's why it's mine in the picture. Yeah, and the, and the reason why, the reason why they call... Inter, in, the reason why they call them interventional radiology is because radiologists is the ones who accepted this, right? And uh, you know they implemented it. So I see. Yeah. So, so now, so now, so now he is, you know, known for that, right? Uh, and the other thing I wanted to show you is this, right? So this is the AHA uh, algorithm. You're gonna learn this once you do your ACLS. But this is what they go by, right? Door to balloon time. This is. To the time they place the balloon and they open the coronary, 90 minutes. Go to needle time is 30 minutes. So that's what the doctors is waiting, right? Can I get a unit there fast enough to take them to the cath lab? If I cannot, I have to give thrombolytics. So, uh, if you guys take a patient without doing a 12 lead to a non-cath -like, non lab capable facility, you're probably going to get thrombolytics, and all coronaries will be open. The standard. Call 911. Right sometimes way. they do. Sometimes they do. Sometimes they do. But usually they, they'll try to get the contracts in place and initiate that. But sometimes they do. Uh, but the best thing you can do to save yourself is do an EKG. You know what I say? One EKG is gives you baseline. Second one gives you trend, right? Uh, so second one gives you comparison, and the third one gives you trend. So always when you're with the patient, always get serial EKG, 12 lead. How do you do that? Put a 12 lead, let's say in the house, you did it, right? Don't snap away your leads, right? In the, in the bus, do another one. And right before you pull into the ER, do another one. What if you got a, what if you got a STEMI on the third one and you're in the parking lot of non-cath lab capable facility? 
Call, call telemetry, transmit. Take him to the cattle. Don't just, don't I'll be like, ah, I'm across, the, I'm in the hospital. I'm just gonna roll him in. Sorry, read that right So you call, you call telemetry. You say now he was complaining of chest pain. We did a first EKG, no STEMI. Now he got a STEMI. Take him to the cath lab, right? Don't just, just sit there idly. Take him to the Right. So the, the the last thing I'll show you, the last thing I'll show you, right? This is your standard EKG, right? Right, your normal totally. But the I said the the standard EKG cannot see the back side of the heart, right? So for us to see the back side, we have to do the 15 lead EKG. So you have to unsnap the fourth V V4, put it, make it V4R, and then unsnap V5, V6, and you're basically going to put them in the back. You're going to label them as V8, V9, right? Scapula, yeah. So uh, the 12 lead only shows you the front and the side view, but the 15 lead is going to show you the right side of the heart and the back view, right? Yeah. I think the hospitals put the leads on differently, like. Like weird, I don't know, like a triangle looking. But you mean, I don't know for the standard EKG? Oh, I don't know. I'd for think. the standard EKG or for 15 lead EKG? Good old man. I, don't know, I, don't know. I, I just see them with like they're not like limbing or anything or like like that. It's just like kind of like. Try, yeah, because on the machine, you see how they they snap these things to connect them, right? Uh, the, these should be placed ba based on the uh, anatomical arrangement, so you have to palpate, right? Uh, but the reason they made triangles is because you see how they clip them on, right? That might be the reason, but I, I, I'm not sure I would have to take a look. But, um, yeah. So, regular ALS monitor doesn't have a 15 lead, right? So this is only something you can do in a hospital? You no, no, no. You're, no, no so this, this one, listen to what I'm saying. Your, your, your standard 12 lead, right? You are able to do the 15 lead if you manipulate some things. So what you're doing is this. From, the, from here, right, this is, this is V1. V2, V3, V4, V5, V6. You're going to unclip V4, you're going to move it to the right side. You're going to unclip V5, V6, and you're going to put them over here on the back of the scapula. So what I'm saying is I take from here, I put here. V5, V6, I take from here, and I put it in the back. And then I'm going to do another EKG, but very important, the moment it comes out, what you got to do is this. You have to cross, cross out where it says... V4, V5, V6, you have to cross out, you have to say V4, R, V8, V9. Because you're now looking at the right side, and you're looking at the posterior, so you don't get confused. And then when you give it to the people, they don't get confused. So here, this this is actually, this already has a STEMI, right? They just wanted to see if there was right ventricular involvement, and there was posterior wall involvement. So yes, you see how it's elevated? But here, they already have a STEMI. So this guy is going to the cath lab no matter what, right? But what if you have a patient who doesn't have this? And they have isolated posterior stemmy. So this is the case I'll show you. I had I had uh, right, so I had this case. So let me let me show you the, the top one, right? So the top one, right? You can you can't really see a clear cut stemmy here, right? <laughs> You can't really see a, a clear cut stemmy, right? But here, right, you see depressions here. Right? You see depressions, right? So then I, I, I this is your regular V4, V5, V6. So then I, this patient was going, by the way, they, they were not going to the cath lab. They were going for end stemmy because troponin was elevated and they were going to the CCU to be there to be observed. But then, patient, uh, right, I saw this, so I quickly unsnapped the leads, right? Time is 1307. This one is done 1308, right? And here, right, what you see before RV8, V9. Right, you see elevation. So I know there was there was a posterior wall moment. So so I go, we take them to uh, to the CCU, and I find the cardiologist say, hey, listen, I showed them the EKG. I said, I don't want to take off the stretcher. We got to go to the cath lab now because she's having a STEMI. Right. Uh, uh, it was into facility transfer. It was into facility transfer. It wasn't 911. It was into facility. So it was from from one hospital. To the CCU of another hospital, cath lab, right? So, so we took the patient to the cath lab. I was there, and I said, "Can we watch the procedure?" Because I wanted to see, right? And uh, I, I remember, I, I remember Joy because, because Joy was looking at me like I was retarded by doing the back wall. He's like, "You know, they go in the front." So, so then he's like, he goes from, uh, he goes from like, you know, that, and he's like, I, "We went to the procedure, so we're standing behind." Uh, when we see the screens and we see the blockage and they open up and he was like he, he didn't understand what happened 
And uh, I think the patient also doesn't understand because we're kind of, we're like very quickly. And I don't think they, like the family and the, and the patient, I didn't want to alarm the patient saying you're like, you're having an active heart attack. I said, I, I think something's going on with your heart that needs emergency treatment, right? But we're going to take you to the right place. And, uh, but imagine if we just followed what they told us, just take them to the CCU, I didn't even bother doing any of that. To be honest with you, I didn't even have to do the trolley. The trolley was given to me. But right? just a curious... Curious no, but like, That's no, it's it's not that they're curious, right? You see the patient's having pain. I could see on her face, right? She wasn't like was fine. Yeah. And so I do I do the first one, right? And I see there's something right there, right? I have something. something. Some, I have depressions, right? So I, I, I was, I, I was, at this point, I, I, the way she was looking, she wasn't, she wasn't stable. Right? A patient like this is not stable. So, and she was diaphoretic too. So I did the run. I run the back, right, and... Was that the first time you ever did that? The, the, no, I did, I did that before, but this is the first time where it was positive. <laughs> <laughs> well, you were looking for it. So this time it was positive. <laughs> when you go looking, you find it. Right? But, yeah, yeah. but think about how much we probably we salvaged her, her, her myocardium, right? Absolutely. So what I'm telling you, right, like this, this stuff is not like nice to know. Sometimes you'll be on the call where you do this and it's going to... I'll show you another case while I had it here. Uh, this other patient, this this was, I was supposed to take this patient back to the nursing home. So this patient, you know, the this patient, I'll tell you what was going on with this patient. She was being discharged back to the nursing home, right? And she came in. She came in. Uh, she came in. Uh, uh, she was she was having uh, chest pain. They thought it was NSTEMI, right? NSTEMI. They run her blood work. Her troponins through the roof, right? I think they gave her some pain medication. The difference between this patient, she couldn't talk, right? That was her baseline, huh? From the pain? No, no. She she just can't, can't talk. Oh, okay. Yeah, she just can't talk, right? Uh, and uh, uh, but what I noted when I came to the room, she was sweating. And it was, she was sitting like, like she, she wasn't clutching her chest, but she was sitting here with like, with like, with like fist like this, like on her, on her, anything I did, she would grind her teeth. Anything we did, like I, yeah, exactly. She would grind her teeth. Thing, yeah. And, and I, I, I was like, I, I put her, I did her vitals and she was a little, she was like, she's not tachycardic, but she's a little tacky, right? Like not, you won't be, you won't be resting in bed with a heart rate of this. So I'm like, I'm like, you know, I check her sugar first, because I'm thinking maybe it's hypoglycemia. Sugar was good, right? And she's having a STEMI, she, and she was not. And she, so basically, we we run this, right? I was trying to find a doctor uh, uh, who there, like to say, like guys got, got a STEMI. Doctor, in the home. home? No, no, no. It was a, this was in the hospital. This was in the hospital. She was being discharged. She was being discharged to the nursing home. Oh, she was being. She was going to the nursing home. I know. I know. Yeah. So I, I, I had to run three floors until I found the doctor who understood what the STEMI even means. I run through three floors. I said, Which did you not? I'm not gonna tell you. That's why we You were the doctor. They then, they then informed me that. That was the borough. They then informed me that this hospital doesn't have a cath lab. A queens. This hospital informs me this hospital doesn't have a cath lab. So now, you have to so now, so now, so now we, I, I call, I call uh, my dispatch and say, hey, listen, we're gonna be diverted, not to the nursing home. <laughs> and we found, we found the hospital that had the cath lab. I bring this patient over there, right? And uh, uh, we, we showed, I showed this to the doctor, and I said, I, I, I said, you, you know, this patient was being discharged back to the nursing home. It was like, really? I'm like, yeah. And you know, it's here you see elevations, but here you have reciprocal changes in the lateral wall. So, and uh, what's our hospital in place? I'm not going to tell you the borough. And then, I, I, did I put it here? I would I like to know what hospital is so I don't take a patient there. So I at least the borough. At least the borough. No, I'll tell I'll, I will not tell you. Uh, <laughs> we'll have slip. Just tell okay. the borough. I had, I had a couple I had a couple other strips. I don't think I put it here, but I had a few strips where I gave adenosine. And it converted the rhythm, and that one was from. Um, they probably uh, did. I tell you how you guys probably give a dentist and you give one and then a flush, 
So what, what I started do, I was doing is I was giving adenosine with one flush, I mean one syringe. So I would take a 20 cc syringe, pull six, and then the rest is saline. Right. And I would, was adenosine? Yeah, so, so what I'm saying is it was, let's say this is a 20 cc syringe, I would take my six milligrams and the rest would be uh, the remainder with two, six milligrams, two ml, and the rest 18 mLs would be saline. And it would give it this one bolus. And every time I started doing that, it would convert. And then they had a study, uh, I'll show you later when we do skills, the single syringe was the best method for terminating tachydysrhythmias. So, so I had a few uh, things, right? So just to be clear, right? So for the 15 kg, you unsnap the V4, you put it on the right side, and then the V6, V5, V6 are going to go on the back wall, right? So this is your 15 kg. This was a study where they look at efficacy and they said, yes, it's good to do this. So, so this is not like Nikolai making this up. Uh, so V4R, right, V4R, and then V8, V9, just remember to relabel. So if you're going to do this, just to show you so that when you show that to the other providers, if you don't relabel, they don't know, uh, they don't know what you're looking at. So is this like, is this like extra thing you could do for the patient, right? Correct. So, so, what I'm saying, so, so think about this, right? Portable, right? Think about the beyond. beyond. Oh, okay. Think about this, right? So this patient, the, they, cha they, they switched from CCU to what? To go into the cath lab. And let's say if we didn't take him to the cath lab, what do you think would happen? Uh, the, the heart would be not salvageable. I don't know, maybe a lot of the that portion will die there and they'll be in CHF, they won't be able to contract and so forth. If I don't relabel this and I give it to another doctor, it will say V4, V5, V6. And they're going to think there's, there is uh, what? Like... Enter your lateral MI, right? But you have to relabel so that they know. For it. You have to yeah, relabel. It's it's not there, but it's somewhere else. Yeah. So the reason, the reason how I knew it, I see, I saw depressions in the anterior leaf, right? So I knew there was possibly a, a, a stemmy in the posterior wall, right? So elevation. So yeah. So and this and look, that mirrors look, the posterior. The front mirrors the back. The front, the, so the front of the heart is the mirror for the back. The front has depressions. So the back must have what? Must elevation. have elevations. There you go. Oh, okay. You got it? Oh, okay, okay. So this is the reciprocal changes for these elevations. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Right? So this this basically, like, you may have a call like this. You may have somebody with chest pain. You do a totally depressions. You'd be like, okay, it's ischemia. Anterior ischemia. Let me take them to non-cath hospital, 901. But if you did this, then you're, you're, you'll have different trajectory, right? Was there any question? Was this clear? 